Shopping becomes an expert discipline with the debut of the TV show The Price is Right in 1956. Although quiz shows, testing contestants' knowledge of various matters of historical, academic, or current interests have long been common on TV and radio, The Price is Right adds a reflexive twist by giving products to those who know the most about other products. Contestants merely guess the cost of various commercial items, refrigerators, bedroom sets, backyard grills, in a faux bidding process to win other items or, alternatively, cash prizes. This makes acquisition its own area of study, since the greatest foils invariably go to the most expert shoppers. Indeed, given the scarcity of information provided about a particular item up for bid, typically brand name and company of manufacture, along with a brief recitation of promotional literature, contestants on The Price is Right, as a rule, depend largely on intuition rather than a deduction to arrive at their answers. Winning's a matter of having logged so many hours in department stores that the price of consumer items becomes something you feel, the way a school's jazz pianist can improvise in a melodic scale or a mathematician can make a semi-conscious leap to solve a complicated calculus problem. In math and music, such virtuosity is rare, but the abilities sought on The Price is Right are plainly easier to come by because the show picks its contestants from the general public. This lets folks from all walks of life feel like they have a valuable talent and also makes the spectators feel like they're part of the show, something for which they're immensely grateful. When, as so often happens, contestants win not only big but extravagantly big, breaking in, say, a top-of-the-line Chevrolet, a $500 ornamental chessboard, a backyard pool, and an all-expenses-paid trip to Rome, I, for one, sense an almost fearful bewilderment in their hand-clapping ecstasy. The curtain draws back on their cornucopia of prizes, and when their eyes go wide and their palms tremble at their cheeks, something seems not entirely right with them, as though this dream of luxury were giving them vertigo the way literal dreams of taking to the air so often do. And it's easy to wonder, too, exactly where this feverish euphoria comes from. The show often seems to select its prizes with a tin ear to largely unwritten but mostly inflexible boundaries of class. Exactly what sort of party would a 20-something bookkeeper just out of school wear a 270-carat diamond necklace to and not feel out of place? But the contestants who lose every round of bidding and walk away with booby prizes carry themselves much the same way. They seem ambivalent merely to have crossed the fourth wall and entered the TV screen spectacle. They're dizzy and flattered from all the attention, but frightened, too, and not merely from being exposed before so many. They've crossed over into the illusion of television, and one can sense the experience has a ghostly feel to it. Unre unreality being, in fact, precisely the mood the show's designers are after. Such unembarrassed exultations of greed dovetail with a festival mood regarding consumerism and consumption more generally. Consider the implacable exuberance of today's ubiquitous advertising models who are featured on game shows and commercials at trade, sh trade exhibitions and other places where products have to look good. Advertising models are tasked with tracing well-manicured fingertips over the contours of the latest trinkets, moving gracefully about them and smiling as though these gizmos were capable of imparting the deepest conceivable happiness in the seat of the human spirit. If their ebullience is somewhat less genuine than that of the winning contestants, it's probably greater than the viewers at home, who is, for the weekday Price is Right broadcasts at least, likely either a jobless worker who can have only the vicarious pleasure of watching these lucky folks enjoy better fortunes than he, or an overburdened housewife who covets the refrigerators, washers, and dryers she hopes might ease her workload. The clever way shows like The Price is Right market durable appliances to housewives is no accident. No longer a warm hearth, the American homestead has become a measurable commodity to marketers and social scientists, a place of calculable labor and consumption. The domestic realm of the post-war years is a well-run machine operated by a housefrau who doubles as a lab assistant and an efficiency expert who knows how to handle modern technology. Advertisers who have developed sophisticated persuasion techniques from having recently promoted two major wars are 
now interested in adapting the new psychological doctrine of behaviorism to fashion sophisticated stimuli. The desired response, naturally, is greater and greater consumption. They conduct studies that specifically target the visual desires of women to produce an institutional image of female shoppers as spectators enthralled by the sight of consumer goods. As often as not, this enthrallment is channeled through ad models performing dance moves of elegance and sophistication. Nuvina, Woman of the Future, pirouettes for General Motors in Design for Dreaming, episode 524, short subject, a cross-promotional film the automaker has created in partnership with Frigidaire, Christian Dior, and sundry other sponsors. Design looks with wild optimism into the future by showcasing some of the leading technologies of the day. For the men, spectacular Cadillacs with space-age ornamental chassis. For the women, intelligent kitchens with half-million-dollar push-button lazy Susans and recipe readers that dispense ingredients in the correct amounts. Not so concerned about the prospect of an atomic-era tyranny of leisure, the carefree Nuvina handles these high-tech accoutrements with a graceful ease, delighted at the prospect of domesticity without labor. She then launches into a gleeful but measured ballet step, the Dance of Tomorrow, with the deliberate smoothness of a Spiegelian efficiency expert. She twirls her way into the arms of a dashing, if rather vacant, gentleman one assumes to be her suitor, and together they zip away in a bubble-top sedan to the city of the future, a labyrinth of roads and bridges over which model slot cars skitter this way and that. Given the effortless future designed for dreaming is promising us, it's never made clear where these cars are off to in such a hurry. It's been five years since Edward R. Murrow used television to yoke together the Brooklyn and Golden Gate bridges, and if this experiment in live broadcasting successfully turned America, even if for an instant, into a virtual realm, a pair of delineating landmarks divided only by a kind of folded space. The country's literal space is being folded, too, in a sense. Nowhere is this more evident than in the pet project of war bureaucrat turned President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who, as he took office, saw an opportunity to turn the massive organizational and industrial war apparatus to peaceful domestic ends. The result is the interstate highway system a behemoth public works program aimed at creating a lattice of uniformly constructed expressways to link America's many urban centers. Much of the nation is today served only by dirt roads or one- and two-lane parkways of varying quality, but the arteries of the IHS are wide and smoothly paved. Signage is to be drawn up consistently, with square green exit markers and blue shields denoting route numbers regardless of whether you're on the East Coast, the West Coast, or somewhere in the middle. If the IHS can't quite fold away the space dividing the nation's points of interest, it can at least smooth them out, engineer them away into flat, uniform expanses. The Bureau of Public Roads accomplishes this by carefully regulating the layout of these IHS highways and byways to enable a national speed limit of 70 miles an hour and thereby make America friendlier to efficient commerce. There are to be no blind hills, the Bureau mandates, no excessive grades that might slow large trucks, no intersections whatsoever. Curbs are gradual to maintain adequate sight lines and prevent fast-moving vehicles from overdriving their visibility. The result of this is a placeless sensation, a feeling of barreling across a homogeneous, paved alienscape, no matter what part of the nation you're really passing through. The Bureau of Public Roads stipulation that the IHS have no intersections means that drivers access these superhighways through gently arcing on-ramps and off-ramps, and once highway-bound, they pass on or under frequent overpasses, all of which accentuates the sense among highway drivers of entering a kind of hyperspace. Attention, captain to crew, attention. Our destination, Altair 4, is now visible on the main viewplate. 
These twin innovations, the folding of the nation's conceptual space by television and the smoothing of its literal space through accelerated auto transit and the IHS, find glorious expression in that seminal Cosmos exploration movie unveiled the same year the Interstate Highway Act makes it through Congress, Buena Vista's Forbidden Planet. Its spacefaring saucer knots, though doubtless familiar looking in their Navy uniforms and unflinching deference to military chains of command, to any veteran of rocket ship XM or conquest of space, are also in a way cast as aliens by virtue of coming from another time rather than another planet. The starship of the United Planets by which they jet across the universal byways at faster than light speed is not a rocket but a largely featureless disk, much like the saucers so early and often used in today's sci-fi movies to populate the battle fleets of Earth's galactic enemies. Here, the flying saucer is suddenly an icon not of an alien threat, but of human scientific and civilized progress. But if the technologically advanced humans of Forbidden Planet and the artificial environments they create for themselves seem unfamiliar to today's moviegoers of the time, this is maybe understandable in a nation that's beginning with its seas of interlocking concrete and propagating television screens to look a little alien itself. November 21, 1783 was a chilly day in Bois de Boulogne, France, as physicist Jean-Francois Pilat and Army Major Marquis Francois d'Arlande took to the sky in the first lighter-than-air balloon. Much of Paris made it out to see this stunning event, including Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. Invented by the Montgolfier brothers, papermakers by trade, the hot air balloon was humanity's first technological venture off the planet's surface. After its successful test flight, this new invention emerged as an idle pastime for the well-to-do, French nobles who could now sail over the countryside as easily as they once sailed in luxury down the Seine, and then later an instrument of warfare, balloons being first used for aerial military reconnaissance before the close of the 18th century. The day of the hot air balloons unveiling was thus a day of celebration as the brokers of economic and political power in France recognized in the flying contraption a valuable tool for expanding their empire as well as sweetening its delights. But not all of the busied and idle rich saw the new invention and the seemingly boundless human ingenuity it indicated as occasion for rejoicing. Legend tells of an unnamed French duchess, duchess in her dotage who, on seeing the balloon lift off the ground, sank into the cushion of her carriage. Oh yes, she muttered, now it's certain. One day they'll learn how to keep people alive forever, but I shall already be dead. Was the duchess's certitude that French know-how would unlock immortality a rational conclusion based on an awestruck but well-reasoned acknowledgement of technology's emerging power? or more an intuitive one, a gut feeling, on witnessing an artificial vehicle in flight, that it was living humanity's destiny to someday occupy the heavens. In the collective mind, ascension has always been one with immortality. The Duchess's dream hitches eternal life to technological innovation, but these days the notion's making the rounds that maybe our souls endure forever, regardless of our technical know-how. This will surely gladden the Duchess at Bois de Boulogne, wherever she might be. The idea of reincarnation is enjoying its current renaissance largely because of a 19th century Irish Protestant named Bridie Murphy. This became a household name in September 1954 when three serialized articles in Empire magazine related the strange story of entrepreneur turned amateur hypnosis Maury Bernstein's attempt to age regress his neighbor, Ruth Simmons, later revealed to be one Virginia Tighe in pseudonym through hypnosis. Bernstein had developed an interest in using age regression to uncover past lives after reading Alexander Cannon's 1953 book, The Power Within. Age regression, Cannon explains, involves asking a hypnotized subject to imagine herself at an earlier stage of life. Hypnotists 
commonly claimed to be able to regress a subject to the age of one, but it was Cannon's innovation to regress patients further, thus investigating the mysteries before birth. Bernstein calls this technique going over the hump, a term that compensates for its silliness by making past life regression seem accessible. And using it, he claims to have sent Simmons back not only to her incarnation as Bridie, but also to colonial America, where she briefly lived as an infant before succumbing to an unspecified illness, and strangest of all, to an ethereal realm we all traverse between lives. In its particulars, Bernstein and Simmons' theology differs little from Cannon's or from Dr. Gina Sermonara's, whose 1950 reincarnation tome, Many Mansions, Bernstein also cites. But the Bridie Murphy story has a currency with 1950s audiences that these other works lack. For one thing, Simmons's account of Bridie's life is detailed and consistent. We first meet her as a four-year-old in trouble with her father for scratching the paint off an iron bed, and over several sessions of hypnosis, her full biography gradually unfolds. Not chronologically, though, so much as like a mystery novel in a halting, untidy disclosure of tantalizing clues. By the end of the first evening, the outlines of Bridie's story are already known. Born in 1798 to a barrister's family in Cork, she marries a local boy named Brian and moves to Belfast, where he writes for the town paper and survives her after she passes away in 1864. But the Bridie character really takes shape as her life story is elaborated in subsequent sessions. In iterations, we learn of her skill at dancing a variety of jigs and preparing beef stew. She talks at length about the games that she used to play with her older brother Duncan and describes her unceremonious marriage and eventual burial. Bernstein's unordered disclosure of Bridie's history grants the book an unearned feel of authenticity while it gives the reader the sort of pleasure he might get from a well-crafted courtroom drama. The Bridie Murphy franchise was also successful because Bernstein had a talent for tie-in marketing. Capitalizing on the furor of the Empire series, he quickly put out an LP adapted from tape recordings of the Bridie Sessions, followed in 1956 by a full-length book and finally a feature movie. The search for Bridie Murphy did well on the bestseller list, and the record and movie were also brisk moneymakers. The detail with which Ruth Siemens told Bridie's story contributed to its popularity not only in the traditional sense, all stories benefit from just the right delving into minutiae, but because they made the afterworld quantifiable, something that could be investigated and possibly proven or debunked. Almost immediately after the Empire articles hit newsstands, spirited researchers on all sides lit into the particulars of Bridie's case. From William J. Barker, who scoured the 19th century novels of the Belfast newsletter for a byline from Bridie's alleged husband, to non-believers who claimed, among other things, that the metal bed Bridie was supposed to have slept in so early in her life wasn't invented until 1850, or that the book The Sorrows of Deidre uh, Bridie claimed to have read was only published a half century later in 1905. Whatever a columnist or researcher's position, here she found much more objective grounds for argument than was typical on the usually ethereal subject of life after death. And Bernstein's masterful stroke of releasing the audio recordings of the Bridie sessions added to the sense that the astral plane was now amenable to scientific rationalism and old fashioned detective work. To the believers, the Bridie tapes were like a live microphone transmitting testimony directly from heaven. For agnostics and unbelievers, they were an indictment of Bernstein and Simmons' hucksterism, a shyster act whose phoniness was perfectly obvious to anyone who really listened. Faithful and skeptic alike stirred such a frenzy over Bernstein's tapes that the movie adaptation of The Search for Bridie Murphy evokes them in its opening frames, assuring the viewer in an introductory placard that the movie's hypnosis scenes are excerpts from the authentic tape recordings. The question of whether the original tape recordings are authentic is here shamelessly begged. As with the level of detail Bernstein provides, however, and the courtroom testimony style with which the story is told, the placard lends the whole exercise an unearned air of credibility, and the Bridie story's reiteration in a variety of media 
makes it seem more believable. Although Bernstein's veracity has historically been the key concern whenever someone takes up the issue of Brady Murphy of equal interest is this shift of the immortality problem from the spiritual to the rational. Or maybe it would be more accurate to call it an attempt to fuse reason with the spiritual in its own way like Descartes' project or of more than three centuries before. Descartes hoped to prove a prime cogito, a irreducible kernel of humanity that no feat of skepticism could dismantle. Bernstein and Simmons hoped to conduct an experiment in whether man's consciousness survives the death of his physical body. Their experiment was founded on empirical evidence where Descartes is involved a priori, a priori reasoning, but the popularity of the Bridie story doubtless had to do with the prospect that proof or disproof of life after death might finally be at hand. The search for Bridie Murphy isn't the first post-war portent of an emergent cultural obsession with the afterlife. L. Ron Hubbard's immensely popular Dianetics came out in 1950. Bridie Murphy's commercial success, though, the film version particularly, the genre of the historical costume romance being quite popular in theaters at this time, has inspired at least two low-budget imitators. Last year's I've Lived Before and The She-Creature, 1956, episode 808, Hope to capitalize on the spike of interest in past life regression Bridie Murphy has conjured on its way from Empire Magazine to the big screen. These later movies lift a lot of Bridie's basic tricks. Hypnosis is invariably the means used to jog the subject's recollection of her previous lives. Reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders are typically on hand to keep an objective record of the event. And I've Lived Before and The Undead, episode 806, feature repeated flashbacks to dramatic scenes from past eras, complete with perioded dress in the hopes of enhancing box office appeal. Though the past life regress subjects in these films are almost uniformly female, uh, in keeping with Bernstein's contention that women are especially interested in prenatal regression, I Have Lived Before spans the gender divide, sort of, by giving us a man who recalls a previous embodiment as a woman. Finally, since Bridie Murphy fails to address the Buddhist proposition, or, if you like, the Darwinian one, that humans may return as some other creature, the she-creature explores the possibility of conducting regression to humanity's evolutionary forebears. These various imitators not only borrow aspects of Bernstein and Simmons' story, but also include plot elements that reference Bridie as a popular phenomenon. Public, public fascination with the Bridie franchise has started to ebb even as these knockoffs are coming out, as one detractor after another takes to the popular press to question Bernstein's research. Questioning this, the makers of these movies find ways to take digs at Bernstein from within the context of their stories, so that the hypnotist in The She-Creature is Dr. Carlo Lombardi, a lecherous carny sideshow huckster. In The Undead, he's a misanthropic opportunist. In this way, the imitations evolve into meta-adaptations, concerned not only with repackaging and selling the original, but also with the way the original was packaged and sold. The she-creature is particularly eclectic. Not content to simply regurgitate Bernstein's story, writer Lou Russoff also adds a murder mystery, as those associated with Lombardi's act, particularly skeptics, repeatedly turn up mutilated and a romance, as a psychic researcher investigated both the murders and Lombardi's veracity, falls in love with the doctor's hapless subject, Andrea Talbot. Meanwhile, the attention of the police only piques curiosity in Lombardi and Talbot, who claims, Ruth Simmons style, to be channeling the soul of 11th century Brit Elizabeth Weatherby. Lombardi alternates between giving carnival performances and entertaining at cocktail parties for a wealthy local magnet, Mr. Chappelle, and as ticket sales mount, the unscrupulous Chappelle offers to invest in Lombardi's act. Seeing a potential fortune in the making, he convinces Lombardi to write a book about his and Talbot's experiences and support it with a promotional tour. With the Chappelle's fundraising resources, the act graduates from parlor trick to national sensation. The nod to the Bridie Murphy phenomenon can scarcely be more obvious to audiences. The movie version only came out last year. 
And here, the she-creature ventures even further into meta-narrative by incorporating not only the Bridie Murphy movie, but also the Bernstein book and the various promotions that landed it on the bestseller lists. Bernstein and Virginia Tighe benefited financially and popularly from the success of the Bridie Murphy story. They also suffered Bernstein by being subjected to ridicule Tighe via harassment from believers and skeptics alike. Likewise, in She-Creature, when fame arrives, it treats all the parties involved cruelly. Chappelle is taken for a ride by the opportunist Lombardi, who shacks up in his home without compensating him, spooking his family and house guests. And Lombardi, in turn, chafes under the disdain heaped on him by Chappelle, who thinks him a fraud. But it should maybe come as no surprise, given today's sexist fetish for the damsel in distress, that the greatest suffering is reserved for Andrea. As the books roll off the press and the hypnotist act gets more bookings, poor Andrea must spend more and more time under hypnosis, continually enduring serial past-life regressions for one paying audience after another. The movie conveys this initially in a montage of fades and double exposures in which mass-produced hardback copies of the book share the screen with close-ups of Andrea on stage weary from the weight of her many lives. In her private conversations with Lombardi and when the psychic researcher Ted Erickson questions her about the mysterious murders, she stares drearily at the middle distance, so perpetually compelled to live as Elizabeth Weatherby or as the primordial she-creature we later learn has been responsible for the various killings, that her present identity seems to have been bleached out. It's tricky to define identity as an indivisible self inhabiting a succession of bodies. Lombardi describes this philosophy, which is lifted essentially whole from Bridie Murphy, as a chain of being. My next experiment is a most interesting one, Doctor. I shall prove that life is an endless chain, that we are given the gift of it not for one lifespan, but since the beginning of time. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall give you living proof of reincarnation, of perpetual life itself. But in its particulars, it's hard to articulate consistently. And when Bridie Murphy is doing the jig, when Bridie executes the steps she knows using Ruth Simmons's body at Maury Bernstein's direction. When a spirit passes from one life to another, does the true self reside in the fading identity of the deceased, the emergent one of the soon to be born? or the abstract interim soul in its formless purgatory. In Andrea's case, this essential dilemma becomes a function of mass production as her life story, lives story, is transformed into a reproducible quantity. She fades. One thinks of the ill-defined aura Walter Benjamin laments the loss of in his classic essay, Mechanical Art in the Age of Reproduction. Where the art being reproduced takes as its subject the immortal ego, though, in she-creature, this same soul becomes precisely the aura that is sacrificed, reduced to an evacuated shell in the process of being endlessly boxed into a package, copied and sold. Andrea's sad state of psychic confinement is a function not only of her exploitable capacity to recall previous lives, but also of Lombardi's selfish desire to possess her. Imagining himself to be in love with her, Lombardi uses his talent for inducing trances to keep Andrea in thrall and try to implant the hypnotic suggestion that she loves him too. The ability to mesmerize a woman into falling in love has long been particularly sought after among pubescent boys, which doubtless accounts for the prevalence of ads for how-to hypnosis kits alongside those for x-ray glasses in the comic books of Bridie's time. And after all, adolescent boys made up much of the target market for movies like She-Creature. The movie thankfully shrinks from rewarding Lombardi's perverse attempt at sexual enslavement. Though her perpetual trance obliges her to participate in Lombardi's sideshow act, she continually threatens his life and tells him that she finds him repulsive. The beast she becomes at the primordial limit of her life regression is just as much an expression of her hatred for Lombardi, as it is payback for his mad scientific quest to unearth the or origin of the chain of being. The mysteries of life can't be co-opted so rationally, nor evidently can the vicissitudes of love. 
In fact, Andrea loves not the middle-aged and lumpen Lombardi, but the slightly less middle-aged and lumpen psychic researcher Ted Erickson. Though it's hard to tell how much of this has to do with him per se, and how much is simply because he's her only way of escaping Lombardi's clutches. The police do their best to solve the case, but without Dr. Erickson's willingness to accept and understand the paranormal, they're ill-equipped to reach the conclusion he eventually does. That Andrea's being transformed into an ancient humanoid beast and committing murders at Lombardi's urging. Predictably, once Lombardi learns that Erickson has found him out, he tries to send the she-creature after Erickson. But besotted with love for him and hatred for Lombardi, the monster manages to turn against the mesmerist despite his power over her. In his dying moments, Lombardi repents and uses his last breath to dispel the hex. He's cast over her, fraying her and Erickson to run off together and spend the rest of their lives acting like none of this ever happened. Here, the she-creature feels indebted less to search for Bridie Murphy than to genre pictures in the mold of Forbidden Planet, with the rescued damsel and her rescuer forming a romantic bond. Like Altera, Andrea inhabits a small group dynamic mirroring that described in the Electric Complex, with the daughter first coveting the father and then choosing a mate based on his social relation to the father figure. We're led to believe that Andrea is coupled with Erickson of her own free will, so it's curious. Lombardi feels the need to offer his blessing. Certainly this is in part because he's enthralled her, but it's hard not to think of father giving his daughter away, the suitor asking the dad for permission. To say Andrea's caught up in an electric complex isn't to say that she has romantic interest in Lombardi, or even affection. She treats him with open contempt. This is a common fallacy regarding Oedipal and electric complexes, that they require a psychosexual dimension. Her relationship with Lombardi resembles a father-daughter relationship insofar as both are compulsory. Just as insolent Terry from Teenage Crime Wave, 1955, episode 522, didn't ask to be born, Andrea didn't ask to be taken ca captive. She's simply making the best of a bad situation. Consequently, she often carries a suppressed, soft-spoken demeanor. She's fully conscious, fully aware of the power Lombardi exerts over her mind. But until she sees an opportunity to get leverage on him, she's chosen to bide her time. From the outside, this resembles codependence, but the apparent complicity in the relationship is fraudulent. She finally gets her leverage, of course, in her beastly incarnation. The she-creature recalls, once again, Forbidden Planet's monster from the id, which in both instances winds up killing the father figure to set the young couple free. Where the knowledge of the Krell machines is deliberately repressed, so too Andrea and Ted eventually opt to spend the rest of their lives together without ever sharing with another living soul what they've learned about the chain of being. I Lived Before and the Undead feature repeated flashbacks to dramatic scenes from past eras, complete with period dress in the hopes of enhancing box office appeal. Over the months, though, the Bridie imitations have taken on features from other genres as well. In The Undead, for instance, Roger Corman transforms the housewife as reluctant visionary into a prostitute and adds a perfunctory subplot about the medieval persecution of witchcraft to enhance the film's bankability. Bridie Murphy never had any children, and the obscurity into which her name has fallen is a conspicuous point in Bernstein's account as he and fellow researchers invariably come up empty-handed in their attempts to scrounge up records of her existence. But in Bernstein's chain of being, such lack of mortal agency is of no consequence. The self endures and so needs little of worldly works or descendants to carry on its name. The curious thing is that She-Creature also stipulates as to the veracity of the chain of being, but the heroes simply cover up the knowledge of its existence at the end, as though the fate of our immortal soul were something we were better off not knowing, a terrible knowledge that stood to jeopardize the conventional atomic family in today's entrenched patrilineal lifestyle. The She-Creature culminates as though it were Bridie Murphy run in reverse. As Murphy closes, Maury and Ruth are content in their certainty that the soul has man many mansions and are driven only to spread this miraculous message to the world at large. 
One wonders why Andrea and Ted don't simply hit the talk social circuit to broadcast their newfound metaphysical awareness. But as the curtain draws on the she-creature, they seem happy to return to conventional society and pretend they were never shown what awaits our spirits beyond the veil. Like the allegedly irreducible atom, the indivisible self, that is the human essence, the kernel of ego, is a thing forbidden from contemplation situated at the limit of human knowledge. But unlike the real-life dabbling fools responsible for the atom bomb, or the fictional madmen and villains who exploit dangerous technologies and arcane magic for personal gain, or to realize some crazed utopian vision, Andrea and Ted are content with this. Both have learned the hard way that to become aware of the process of reincarnation is to learn of the painful muddle the immutable self must endure as it passes from one earthly existence to the next. After hellish descents into the firestorms of World War II and the Korean conflict, America has turned back to Christ in recent years. This brings its own tumult, Joseph McCarthy's crusade against the godless communists for one, but the worshipful small-town family has come to embody a promised utopia, finally at hand now that the atom bomb has put an end to war, and in the atoms for peace have put an end to deprivation. The small Christian American town is a modern-day Garden of Eden, at least to hear the Saturday Evening Post or Leave it to Beaver tell it. America's post-war suburbs are evidently peopled exclusively by practicing Anglo-Saxon Protestant families over whom preside great white fathers who model their benevolent domination over the Lord of the New Testament. Christianity, though, is in greater crisis than these untroubled narratives would indicate. For one thing, there's the crisp memory of the Second World War, in which humanity had, in the atomic bomb, coveted powers seemingly best left to God. In 1945, following the atomic bombings of Japan, American theologian Richard Fagley wrote that the end of the world depends upon the ability of the moral and religious forums to call man effectively to repentance, worship, and service. Seventy years later, the successful British test of a hydrogen device prompted Winston Churchill to speculate that God had wearied of mankind. Thus, this newfound scientific prowess brought the prospect of man-made Armageddon within sight, and in doing so, challenged God's proprietorship over our collective fortunes. Note that in Fagley's Gospel, the individual souls of the unsaved are not at issue, but rather the fate of the world at large, whose preservation now lies not in God's hands, but in our ability to bring society to faith in him. The prodigious scientific advancements of the war have also prompted a rationalism that has made many Christian tenets, a 6,000-year-old world with its hastily fashioned canopy of stars, the lonely couple in Genesis who were to believe gave rise to 2.8 billion souls, even more quaintly implausible. Indeed, humanity seems, symbolically if not causally, to have become a thing of its own making, For example, in June 1952, the Institute for Advanced Study developed a sophisticated computer meant to provide the prodigious calculating power needed to advance the technology of the hydrogen bomb, while in 1953, Watson and Crick deciphered the helical structure of DNA. Since then, the coincidence of these two events has forged an enduring correlation between them, as the human genetic code has come to be likened to digital data, and computers are thought of as mechanical brains or thinking machines. Watson and Crick's accomplishment has elevated genetics to a newfound level of refinement, further weighting the scales in the evolution-creationism debate. The emergent capacity of science to design devices that can emulate human thought, meanwhile, makes God's role in forging mortal souls seem ever more extraneous. All this has scarcely advanced the cause of godless communism in America, Polls in the early 50s regularly register the percentage of people disavowing Judeo-Christian beliefs to be in the low single digits. Instead, Christianity is to be retooled for the modern age, though how this will be done depends on whom you talk to. Some see science's challenge to religion mostly as a test of faith and respond by preaching established dogma that much more vociferously. This phenomenon doubtless contributes not only to the McCarthy frenzy, but also to the rise of evangelists like Billy Graham. 
the young reverend freely conjures the specter of damnation for anyone who ponders science's relationship to the Christian faith too carefully. For this, his traveling ministry draws a growing flock and, ironically, a regular broadcast spot on that wonder of scientific achievement, the television. Other more liberal religious thinkers feel that Judeo-Christian trappings can be updated to accommodate post-war modernity. Otto Spaeth of the Liturgical Arts Society, for example, calls for a revision in the way churches are designed that accounts for the lifestyle of the new suburban worshiper. The first requirement of a church or temple today is that it be of today, he writes. The modern suburbanite drives a streamlined car to work in an office or factory where everything has been designed for maximum efficiency and comfort. Whereas come Sunday morning, he is asked to hurl himself back centuries to say his prayers in the pious gloom of a Gothic or Romanesque past. The implication of all this is that God does not exist today. The answer for Spaeth lies in humbler churches that snuggle quietly into a residential neighborhood rather than rising majestically or pretentiously over all their surroundings. Examples of such modest chapels from coast to coast include in the east the Priory of St. Gregory in Rhode Island, in the west the First Presbyterian Church of Cottage Grove, Oregon. In the middle we have the First Baptist Church of Bloomington, Indiana. Where new churches are to blend in with their surrounding neighborhoods, emerging neighborhoods incorporated houses of worship seamlessly into their design. William Levitt furnished lands for churches alongside schools and swimming pools in developing his functional and affordable Long Island suburb, although it's not clear whether this was because he shared space philosophy or simply wanted to control as every aspect of the building process for reasons of efficiency. Maury Bernstein can probably be situated in the more progressive camp of Fagley and Spaeth than the reactionary one of Billy Graham if the search for Brady Murphy, a devout if unconventional work, is any indication. At its core, though, Bernstein's project, the synthesis of Christianity and the quasi-Buddhist belief that the immortal soul passes through more than one earthly body, surely exceeds what even these progressive reformists had in mind. Christendom in general takes a dim view of reincarnation and, as institutions founded on faith, churches of whatever denomination frown on the notion that the afterlife could be objectively investigated. Knowing this, Bernstein liberally quotes biblical verse but puts it to his own vaguely heretical purposes. For instance, quite literally interpreting the biblical injunction that ye must be born again which evangelists like Graham are even now using to menace their parishioners with the prospect of eternal hellfire. Bernstein also borrows from reincarnationist Genus Sermonara the theory that in the verse, In a man's life there are many mansions. The mansions in question are successful, successive bodies through which the indivisible spirit passes on an evolutionary quest for Christ-like perfection. Echoing, in its way, out of space belief that spirituality can be found in the ostensibly drab environs and designs of residential communities, Bridie Murphy, book and movie both, is suburban through and through. Virtu virtually all of it transpires in either the Bernsteins or the Simmons' living room, and it takes as its departure the popularity of parlor trick hypnosis as a casual amusement at suburban get-togethers. Recall the silly games at parties J. Roland Ronald Oakley so disparages in mass-produced suburbs. Murphy's conjunction of religiosity and small-town hominess gives the impression that it hopes to lend spiritual significance to the suburban lifestyle. After all, many social critics feel that these newfangled housing developments deaden the soul, though this is a matter of some debate. Here, nearly 5,000 new homes per year rise out of an area that was only yesterday swamp and meadow and brush. The speed and precision teamwork that makes possible this mass production of low-cost homes on a profit-producing basis is a tribute to the enterprise of the American construction industry. Even as William Levitt chafes against his critics, his own brother Alfred inadvertently makes their point when he speaks to this tedium li of life as an extension of mass production. The same man does the same thing every day, despite the psychologists, he concedes. It is boring. It is bad. 
but the reward of the green stuff seems to alleviate the boredom of the work. Bernstein himself was a businessman, a partner at the Bernstein Barthers Equipment Company, but hardly seemed content to devote his life to the accumulation of green stuff, unless one counts the doubtlessly sizable returns on the Bridie Mar Murphy franchise itself, a point we'll return to presently. His sleepy Colorado neighborhood, moreover, is far from being a soporific com commuter farm. Big things are going on there, and not only the silly party games of the middle class, which are in Bernstein's world an occasion for addressing heady questions of immortality. In the movie version of Bridie, backyard cookout conversation revolves around reductionist to detailed theological debate with a reverend Catholic priest and professor of psychology, all in hand to contribute to their various expert perspectives. No idle banter about the local ball team's record here. Alluding to the origins of urban flight and the desire to flee cities targeted for nuclear attack, writer Lewis Mumford finds in the suburban escape, ironically, a low-grade environment from which escape is impossible. But for Bernstein, the burbs are a place to confront the doomsday problem head-on. Leaning against a cozy fireplace with a drink in his hand, he extols to a friend the prospect of harnessing past life regression for spiritual insight, which he sees as having the potential to keep humanity from blowing itself up. In an appendix, he cites his and Ruth Simmons's couchside excursions into inner space as having the potential to unlock the mind's hidden capacity for ESP, which could in turn be enlisted in the nation's defense by exposing plans for warfare and secret weapons in the making. Psychic spies uncovering the next Manhattan Project. Hall's not quite paradise, even in his Elysian neighborhood, however, as we learn when Bridie starts discussing the afterworld, that ethereal place we inhabit between bodies. Existence there is as tedious as assembly line work, as though Mornstein or Simmons took his inspiration less from the vivid hallucinatory imagery of Paradise Lost or Dante's trilogy than the arid placenesses of, say, an airport terminal or a movie theater. The search for Bridie Murphy's spirit world has no shape or distinctness because its tenant spirits lack physical form. To convey this, the movie uses the familiar trick of superimposing Bridie's disembodied face over a swirl of mist. Simmons describes it as an unhappy purgatory that isn't full enough, where one can't accomplish anything, and people inexplicably, inexplicably drift away before one has had a chance to talk to them for very long. These people, too, exhibit a certain surreal sameness. When Bridie encounters her younger brother, who died as an infant, he can speak, and at the other extreme, Bridie, though having grown bodily weary near death, soon, find, soon feels her exhaustion dissipate. Souls in the afterlife retain the appearance they had at life's end, but in spirit, they all have about the same interpretive and communicative capacity. It's as though Bernstein managed to enliven the shapeless suburbs with spirit and significance, but at the cost of defeaturing the spirit realm. Indeed, for Bernstein or Simmons or Bridie, the author of these otherworldly accounts isn't uh, entirely uh, clear, the afterlife looks a lot like Mumford's suburbs. Its topography is uniform and unidentifiable, as Mumford writes of Levittown. This cookie-cutter suburb, first built in Long Island in 1947, was modeled after the Higgins boats that dumped D-Day soldiers onto the Normandy beaches. A second suburb built a few years later in Pennsylvania was also called Levittown, and this made sense because the neighborhoods are designed to be indistinguishable. The inhabitants of these Levittowns are those of the same class, the same incomes, the same age group, Mumford adds. The mole people of the suburbs are witnessing the same television performances as well, which at first seems to be where the comparison breaks down, but not so. With little to do in the afterworld, its denizens pass most of their time in idle spectatorship like moviegoers. Able to perceive but not act in any meaningful way, the deceased in Bridie Murphy's purgatory simply watch those who survive them on earth, gazing longingly at the living like the moribund spirits and sarts no exit. In this, they are aided by the ability to travel instantly, 
Bridie flits between Cork and Belfast with the perfect ease, giving them the omnivenance of an edited narrative film. Just as in the movies, in the astral world, you can see and hear but not smell, taste, or touch, presumably because sight and sound are the senses most closely associated with cognition, whereas the other three senses are most more closely associated with primitivism and the body, and so are less likely to endure physical death. The glow of the afterworld, we're told, is a light that isn't like night or day. A paradox that calls to mind the fully illuminated darkness of a movie theater. Well, suppose all our energy had been deposited in the Sun Power Bank Incorporated, founded millions of years ago with assets unlimited. In 1850, each American, for instance, withdrew enough fuel from the fuel bank to generate 400 horsepower hours for himself. But nobody worried too much about it. Our assets still appeared unlimited. In 1950, each American withdrew 10,000 horsepower hours from Sun Power Incorporated while atomic scientists were making some minor deposits. This began to worry us. Our assets were becoming definitely limited. By 1975, we'll probably withdraw 20,000 horsepower hours each. Atomic energy fuel deposits will stave off the run for some time, but there's only so much uranium and thorium in the world, and that will go too.